the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Hello and welcome back to the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson, and today I am joined by a very special guest, Dr. Peter Stefel. Peter, welcome. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Hello and hello, everyone. It's so such a wonderful day to do this. Oh, I it's a beautiful day. I'm so excited to have you on the show because this is your first interview since you earned your PhD. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Yes, no, it was just over a week ago, nearly two weeks ago now. So I'm a new new doctor. Hello. I yeah, love it's very surreal. It's very surreal. Well, you worked very hard for this, and why don't you let everybody know what it is that your PhD topic was? Yes, so I, I mean, I think most people by now know who I am, um, but I did the iconography of Queen Mary I, so the daughter of Catherine of Aragon and Henry VIII. So I basically looked at all of her paintings, coins, medals, and any other sort of illustration which had her on, because everyone always thinks about Oh, you know, the Antonius Moore portrait or maybe the Hans Ueff portrait. But, you know, there's more than two portraits of her. You know, everyone always talks about Elizabeth being this great patron of the art. And, you know, look at all these paintings of her. Or look at Henry's paintings. Look at Edward's paintings. Or, you know, look how wonderful they are. And then when someone asks, oh, what about Mary? Oh, no, don't worry about that. She's not important. Don't worry about it. But, yeah, no, so she is very important. Um, as the thesis um, explained... Yeah, there's loads of portraits of her. And, you know, she's she's a global icon, really. Much better than her cousin, uh, than her brother, brother and sister. Okay, so the question now has to be, out of all of the tutors to choose, what drew you to marry over, say, Elizabeth or Edward or any of the monarchs, mm. to be honest? Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a really good question, actually. Um, so I guess it's... You know, at school, you always learn about Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary, you know, what an evil woman she was. Um, and then it was during my A-levels, so um, 17, 18. I, we, were, we were watching The Tudors, you know, Jonathan Reese mears you know, the one that you shouldn't really like, but everyone secretly does. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you just, I started, what you know, watching Mary's story because I, you know, I knew the basic history, but I never knew, you know, her childhood really and you know the struggles that she laid you know she grew into grew up with um yeah and you know you started watching that and then obviously you read the books which then accompany that and you know then you start getting into the academic stuff and then you just find this figure who's absolutely fascinating you know and amazing because she was our first queen regnant you know i know people talk about jane gray and matilda but that's you know that's another issue um but in, in terms of my eyes mary's the first woman to become queen of england in her own right and it's just you know after everything her dad tries to do to stop her from becoming queen you know she basically puts two features up to her and says uh, actually i'm like my mum you know and my grandma you know we women can rule england and you know and that set the precedent for all of our queens you know and there's a saying in england we always do queens better than kings and i think that's true you know especially the last couple of years, you know, we obviously had the death of Queen Elizabeth. You know, and you can't say she wasn't a good queen. She was absolutely fantastic. You know, it's so yeah, we do queens better, and that's all thanks to Mary. I love that you brought up her mom and her grandma because this is a topic, as you're aware, we've discussed a lot on the show recently with Dr. Emma. And I think that has been a real eye opener for me when it comes to Mary because. We've been led to believe that she was this, oh, poor figure who had such a terrible life. And then she killed a bunch of people. And, oh, well, let's move on to Elizabeth. Really? Yeah, no, exactly. It's, it's crazy. It's absolutely, you know, you think about what she actually, she wasn't just Queen of England, you know, and we'll probably talk about it later on. You know, I know Emma's spoken a lot about it. You know, she was Queen of Spain. Netherlands, you know, Austria, you've got the Archduchess of Austria, all of all of those titles after her, you know, she was technically Queen of you know America, or what would be a come America. You know, no one seems to think about all of that. And it's you know, it's absolutely crazy that no one apart from you know the last twenty years, people have finally re woken up and thinking, Oh, actually, no, she, this woman is actually quite important. 
whether or not you know agree with her policies and all that's that's not our right to decide you know because everyone they're all brutal back then you know it's, <laughs> no one really wants to go back there no, well <laughs> not unless you're always going to be on the right side but you know it's it's crazy you know so i i don't i can't judge her for what she did right or wrong because that's not our right you know we're just there right, this is what happened whether you like it or not you know it happened now you have to see well why did that happen and you know that, i think that's sort of our, our jobs really yeah and she had such an uphill battle to climb as the first queen regnant i mean being the first woman to rule a country or rule england i should say um what an achievement for her, but also I can imagine how terrifying it was for her to know that she had to do it right. Well, exactly. You know, after all those years of, you know, and she was prepared, she did know what she was doing. But when the time actually came, she then had to, you know, embrace her mother, her grandmother's spirit and say, right, I'm actually going to fight for this now because, you know, I can't have my nine year old cousin coming in here. You know, it's absolutely disgraceful. Well, Peter, speaking of disgraceful, you know, of course, Queen Mary, we touched briefly on this already, has that nickname of Bloody Mary, and it has persisted throughout history. Mm. Can you maybe provide some context on the origins of this nickname and yes. whether it, like, accurately reflects her reign or not? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. And I had to actually ask my good colleague, Joe Strong, about this. Um, so it's not, obviously, it's not contemporary at all. So the first use of Bloody Mary is actually in 1658. <laughs> so 100 years after she dies. <laughs> so, so, uh, um, yeah, and it's all, you know, it's um, Nicholas Billingslow. He wrote some um, other book or pamphlet. I can't, don't, I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's called The Infancy of the World. And I f from what the gist of it is, it's basically, oh, Protestants are great, Catholics are bad. You don't want to be like good old Queen Mary who's bloody. Um, yeah, so the nickname Bloody Mary actually comes from 1658. And it's all to do with, you know, when there was unease because James II, well, he's still Duke of York at this point, but, you know, he was, they, everyone knew he would be the next king and they don't, we didn't want a Catholic king for some stupid reason. But oh, well, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it would have been great. Um, I can see why they didn't want him, but, you know. Yeah, so it's 100 years later. So, you know, everyone who actually knew what happened is dead by then. Right. Imagine so, that. It's not contemporary. It was no. created later to make her look bad. Exactly. Completely. You know, it's, I've not read what he's actually writes, but, you know, everyone, like I said earlier, everyone was bloody by then. So what's mm -hmm. the difference? Are we going to say her dad's bloody for murdering all those people from the Pilgrimage of Grace and all the, you know, Buckingham, all of them? You know, what about Elizabeth and her priests and Edward? Because, you know, a lot of people seem to forget Edward actually wanted to bring back the heresy laws in the first place. It's only because he died. It didn't happen. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you know, it's, I mean, luckily, I think the name is going. Well, in academia anyway, it's, it's you know, no one talks about it anymore. And this well, is sort of a joking way or just sort of a stab in the back. Um, but I think, yeah, so it's now we're trying to get the public to realise, no, she wasn't actually bloody. Or if you're going to call her bloody, call all of them bloody. Because, you know, it was bloody times. It really, you know, the whole world was changing. Yeah, it really, it really was bloody times. And, mm -hmm. you know, they talk about Henry VIII murdering 72,000 people, I think is the number <laughs> that I heard. And, and of course, yeah, he, that's, that's he, he ruled for like 38 years or something like that compared to Mary's, what was it, five years? <laughs> five years, yeah. And, you know, okay, so she burned, what, 200, I think two over 238 I think that's the conservative estimate. Okay. But uh, but you have to realize, because, I mean, I looked at this in my, during my master's. These people, they weren't just, you know, picked up off the street and went to get burned. There, there was a whole legal process for, for this, you know. And, and I was reading some of the um, case studies. Some of these people are given two free chances. Mm. So, you know, obviously you, you stick by your beliefs. But if you wanted to really survive, you'd, you know, how many chances does someone need? before they get arrested and you know i mean you, you can see that people don't really want to do it but they're given very little choice right they didn't yeah. have the strong convictions that maybe mary had when her father tried to get her 
mm-hmm. to, you know, admit that she was a bastard, basically. Exactly. You know, it's it's crazy. Like I said, crazy times. Um, but yeah, you know, and a lot of people seem to always think, oh, she's to blame for everything. Okay, she kept, you know, she, she didn't even come up, she revived an earlier policy. But Parliament allowed it. You know, they, they could have stopped it because they stopped other things that she wanted doing. They stopped that. You know, they, they let out, allowed that to happen. You didn't have, obviously, the judiciary. They all allowed it. And it's, you know, it's... Okay, 200, you know, 238 people, unfortunately, perish. But how many more people would it have been if it had been the other way around? I actually, I went to a, a play... A brilliant play by a now good friend of mine, um, which is just closed up for it. And it, it was um all about Jane Grey, Mary and Elizabeth. If they had this like secret meeting the day the night before Jane would, would be executed. And there was this wonderful um, monologue by Jane saying that she would go around the country butchering Catholics. And it really struck me thinking, you know, her government probably would have done that if it'd been the other way around. But, you know, we'll never know. We'll never know what, what would have happened. Um, but, yeah, you know, I think we need to sort of take the burnings into their context. And never mind, you know, think of the European context. You know, how many did it, Philip do burn? You know, maybe not burn, but, you know, how many Protestants were executed in Spain, the Netherlands? You know, even in France, with the Huguenots, you know. You know, St. Bartholomew's Massacre, you know, it's all of those, you know, everything has its context, you know. Unfortunately, these people died for their beliefs, which, you know, modern day sensibilities, you know, you, you wouldn't think that's right. But you have to remember back then, they thought it was the devil's work and mm. you know, they were petrified of it. They were completely petrified. I can only imagine how scary it would have been to live during this time merely because of your religious beliefs. I mean, mm. most everybody in England was Catholic under Henry the Eighth, until he decided to change that. Yeah, exactly. You know, a lot of people seem to forget when Mary actually acceded the throne, most of the country was still Catholic. It was only the minority, you know, the nobility. And I don't know if they were actually genuine in their beliefs or they just thought, oh, this is good for profits. You know, how much land did they receive out of this? You know, and, you know, obviously, if you're, your law, if your gentry or your lord of the manor is a Protestant, then obviously those within those small circles, the local community, they may be influenced by that, you know. I mean, obviously there were a few radicals, which actually reminds me that like, a lot of the people, well, a few of the people who were actually burned were Anabaptists. And Protestants and Catholics both hated those. <laughs> so it's like, well, <laughs> they would have been burnt either way, or at least executed, you know, maybe for treason or something. So I think, yeah, so I guess that's the mistake she made. If she'd did what Elizabeth did and called it treason and not heresy, then maybe we may not even be having this conversation because we think, oh, you know, they were traitors. That's an interesting thing that you bring up. Can you maybe, for the listeners, describe what the difference is between treason and heresy? I can try, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows at this, at this <laughs> stage of time? Um, yeah, no, so, you know, treason is obviously... It's a crime against the monarch, head of state. You know, we still have it today. Every, you know, I think I assume all countries have some sort of resemblance of it. You know, it's it's a direct attack on the monarchy, a complete, you know, direct threat. You know, like I don't know, Anne Boleyn was accused of treason because apparently, she, you know, she obviously apparently slept around with lots of men. Obviously, she didn't, but you know, that's what she was accused of. So that's a direct attack on the king. Or if you know someone has a rebellion, that's a direct account, a direct attack on the monarch. Whereas heresy, it's very much more. You're against God. It's an abomination. You know, it's the devil's work. You you don't accept what the church teaches. You know, and you've got obviously different levels of it. If it's you know minor heresies, you know you may you know have a, a strict word with your priest or something, or you may be punished. You know, um, some cases, um, I think there was an, actually there was a local woman in Ashford, um, Agnes someone, and she, well, she started doing minor heresies and she was ordered to go around the parish church 
you know, I think someone might have whipped her or something, but she was forced to go around the church three, four times. I can't, I don't know, she may have been um, stripped, I can't remember. Um, or then she had to then write a letter saying, oh, how wrong she was about transubstantiation or something. But obviously, that's a major heresy. Um, yeah, so basically, heresies, you're against God, and treason is you're against the king. Loads of people are going to correct me saying, actually, it's this, 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 but trying to make it back. That's, that's the basic difference, I guess. <laughs> if we're going to simplify it, that is yeah, the most simplify simplified. <laughs> for those who aren't experts, heresy, God, treason, king or queen. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you for explaining that. One of the other things I want to touch on, too, is yeah. we have the reign of Edward VI, right? And. Yeah. The political the the political landscape around him is muddled by his uncles and John Dudley and the reputation that England starts to receive during the reign of Edward the Sixth, and then he unexpectedly dies. Jane Grey comes to the throne. There's all this chaos, right? It's probably making England look pretty bad. Um, I know the, who, who would want to go to England at this stage. <laughs> right, they're like steer like, clear. Well, yeah, stay clear. Don't. Whoever goes there doesn't come back. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, you know, it's it's crazy. You know, obviously Edward dies on the 6th of July, 1553. You know, and no fault for Jane personally, even though she wasn't as innocent as everyone thinks she is. You know, mm -hmm. she's as much of a zealot as all of them. Um, obviously, she's then proclaimed queen. But this is where obviously I differ because in my head, in my head canon, you can't, okay, you can proclaim someone as queen doesn't mean they actually are queen so as soon as edward dies mary is queen by the you know king the queen's two bodies or if you want to talk about the crown you know, the crown transcends from edward to mary straight away no questions asked obviously then people say oh well jay what about jane yeah but okay you may be proclaimed doesn't mean you actually like i said it doesn't mean you actually are so mary and jane or jane was proclaimed queen mary was the actual queen also you have that whole you know, nine, well, 13 days, really. She wasn't a nine day queen. She was a 13 day puppet, I'd like to call her. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, Jane fans. You know, I do appreciate Jane, but, you know, she was a, you know, we all know she was a, a puppet, very strong willed puppet, but, you know, well, she was seen to be a puppet. Let's put it that way. She wasn't a puppet, personally. You know, she was a very strong and independent woman by, by her own right. Um, so obviously you have all that. So that's the massive, you know, the first challenge, which Mary, you know, she she's victorious. You know, she doesn't she doesn't even need to fight because everyone already goes to her. And mm. you know, yeah. Dudley then realizes, oh, okay, I think I've miscalculated here. You know, to his peril. Um, obviously, you have Jane's father, who's less off the hook. You know, saying, like, <laughs> okay, so you've tried to put your daughter on the throne, and this is love. It. A lot of people seem to forget how merciful Mary actually was to a lot of people, especially in the beginning. Mm. You know, there were. Um, I remember. I can't remember who what ambassador it was. It may have been um, Renard, the Spanish ambassador, or maybe the French. It was one of them, and they said she's actually too merciful. We don't like that. If it'd been any other, anyone else, you know, they would the um, people the people would have, would have been executed. But she's let them go. Well, that's just a sign of weakness. Well, it's it's not a sign of weakness. It's shown she's merciful. She wants to have a clear start. You know, clean start. This. Let's forget what's happened with my dad and my brother. Let's let's start again. As you know, start afresh. Um, obviously, it doesn't work out that way because obviously you have Thomas Wyatt <laughs> six months later in 1554, and you have that you know White Rebellion. He doesn't like Phil and Mary Marion. So, right, I'm go I know better than this. So I'm going to go march up to London with my you know I think it was five thousand men, ten thousand men. It was something like that. And obviously then Mary again. I mean, there probably were, you know, there were fights within London. Um, but technically, you know, she didn't have to draw the, her sword because she just went and went to the Guildhall and did that wonderful speech, which I'm sure we'll, we'll go into at some point. You know, and again, it was a, not a peaceful end, but, you know, it wasn't a full-scale war on both occasions. Let's talk about that Guildhall speech because yeah, I think... I feel like it's been argued that Elizabeth kind of stole that from her later on. Have you heard that too? I think it's me who said it. 
<laughs> yes, it was me. It was me who said it. And a lot of people start getting angry because I said it. Um, but no, it's it's that no, you know. I mean, whether she stole it, borrowed the mm. ideas, it doesn't really matter. The fact is, we know she said this speech. Um and I'm going to get it up because it's absolutely fantastic. Um, and, you know, Elizabeth does later borrow from it. You know, the whole mother of my nation, that sort of thing. You know, it's Mary says it first. And it's actually recorded during the time, whereas Elizabeth is recorded years later. Oh. So we know Mary actually did say this. Um, let me find it. Oh, here we go. Now, loving subjects, what I am, you right well know. I am your queen, to whom at my coronation, when I was wedded wedded to the realm and to the laws of the same, the spousal ring whereof I have on my finger, which never hither to was, nor hereafter shall be left off. You promised your allegiance and obedience unto me, and that I am the right and true inheritor to the crown of this realm of England. I not only take all Christendom to witness but also your acts of parliament confirming the same. My father, as ye all know, possessed the regal estate by right of inheritance, which now by the right, same right descended unto me. And to him always you showed yourselves most faithful and loving subjects, and him obeyed and served as your liege lord and king. And therefore I doubt not that you will show yourselves likewise to me, his daughter. And then she obviously she goes on and on. And then, I mean, this is the great bit here. I cannot tell how naturally a mother loveth her ch children, for I was never the mother of any. But certainly a prince and governor may as naturally and as earnestly love subjects as the mother doth love her child. Then assure yourselves that I, being sovereign lady and queen, do as earnestly and as tenderly love and favour you. And I, thus loving you, cannot but think that ye as heartily and faithfully love me again, and so loving together in this know of love and concord, I doubt not that we together shall be able to give these rebels a short and speedy overthrow. And then she obviously goes into the whole marriage agreement and everything. But it's like, wow, what a speech. That you is amazing. <laughs> and you know, while you were reading that too, it, it reminds me a little bit of Queen Elizabeth II, the way she spoke. Mm. There yeah. are a lot of similarities there as well. There, there really is, you know, it's the whole mother of the nation, you know. I mean, all monarchs really from the Tudors onwards, sort of present themselves as a mother or father of the nation. You know, I assume maybe, you know, the Plantagenets did as well, but obviously, I don't, you know, I'm not an expert in that. I assume that, I assume most monarchs would try to present themselves as that. Yeah. And I assume it's the same in Europe as well. I mean, we'll have to ask Emma about that. Because <laughs> I, don't, I don't really see Charles V as, as a father figure, really. But I mean, he may have been, you know, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm not. I dare not go into that territory. That's too complex. I was just going to say, and with all the weird incestuous stuff there, he could have been a father, brother, uncle. Cousin. Yeah, brother, <laughs> cousin, wife, sisters, who knows? <laughs> uh, that's the Habsburg for you, though. Actually, no, it's actually really interesting. Just going personal on this. Um, there's a there's a portrait, I think it's in the Prada, um, but I've seen a few copies in England. Um, so Charles V has an illegitimate son called Don Juan of Austria. And someone actually told me that I looked like him. And I thought, no, really? Apparently I do. Apparently I look like this illegitimate son of Charles V. But what's weird is obviously he was Austrian. And where my name is actually from Austria. So ooh, you never know. Wow. You never know. You That's never know. Interesting little <laughs> Peter anecdote there. I know, <laughs> yeah. So it's weird. It's, and then you start wondering, oh, I study Mary, so I'm actually studying my cousin. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> I mean, it might, yeah, I don't know. It's up to you, your views. You can look up um, Don Juan, Don Juan, sorry, Don Jong or Juan of Austria. You need Emma to pronounce the names. So I can't do it. <laughs> yeah, we'll put, um, we'll do, we'll do a side by side of yeah, the two. Yeah, do a side by side. Apparently, it's the eyes and the eyebrows. Oh, that's all it takes. <laughs> that's all it takes, apparently. <laughs> I can't see it personally, but everyone else seems to think it is. So, oh you sure it wasn't Photoshop? So, no. <laughs> that's hilarious. I mean, the poor guy, I think the poor guy died, he died in his 30s. <laughs> so, oh, no. Oh, 
Oh no, no similarities there. None. No, hope no. <laughs> oh gosh, no. <laughs> well, oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's just something off topic. I thought, no, I need to tell people because it's. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. Let's talk some more about the Spanish monarchy and maybe Mary's, oh, what is it I'm trying to say? Clearly, it was important to her to try and make England Catholic again. She yeah. had this great <laughs> influence um, of her mother and um, her aunts and, and mm -hmm. um, her grandparents when she came to the throne, I'm sure, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure it was important for her to reestablish some of the things that they had set in place, but it was kind of a tricky thing for her to do. How did she navigate the politics and the religion of the time? Yeah, no, that's a really good question, you know, and I'm lucky and I'm sure Emma's already mentioned this, but, you know, the Spanish and in the Anglo-Spanish policy, it's not a new, it wasn't a new thing. It's also very going, you know, just carrying on normal, you know, because most, I think, most of the alliances between during the Tudor time, in June sixteenth century, were with the Spanish. Obviously, you had the you know, the odd French alliance every now and again, but most of it, you know, like you know, Henry the Henry the Seventh and Isabel and Ferdinand, you know, Spanish alliance to have Catherine brought over in the first place. Obviously, then you had Catherine of Aragon marry Henry, and then that alliance. And even though, you know, you had a few issues during the Great Matter, you know, Henry did go back to Charles mm -hmm. later on and say, you know, actually, no, we, you know, we, we do need you. You know, so there was that, you know, especially after Catherine died, they sort of went back, back to normal. And then obviously you had Anne of Cleves come over with the, you know, the German side. But it's, yeah, the Anglo-Spanish alliance sort of, it just carried on. Um, I don't know, I don't think it happened during Edward's reign. But, you know, please correct me if I'm wrong. I think that was more French orientated. So then obviously when Mary comes back, it's sort of, oh, we'll just carry on with the Spanish that we always did. Because a lot of people seem to make, you know, they make this big fuss about, oh, when she goes and tries to marry, when she does marry Philip, oh, we can't have all these Spaniards coming over here, you know. But, yeah, but we've always been like that. It's not nothing new. You know, no one likes, you know, even today, no one likes influxes of people coming over you know, it's 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 just an English thing. You know, we don't we don't play foreigners, even though we're all foreigners. But you know, <laughs> I think the one, one thing that people forget too, like when Catherine of Aragon came over, mm. she came over with a bunch of um, servants. Exactly. Her, you know, her ladies married into mm. the English, and so uh, by way, a lot of the English people were also part of Spanish. Part Spanish. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I think the biggest difference was obviously, you know, Philip's a man, not, not a woman. So people are a bit more, oh, we can't, you know, we can't have this, can't have this. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, the way she navigated it, because it was difficult, you know, doesn't matter what she did, people would still disagree with her. And, you know, there's there's accounts in the records, you know, she has to scream, you know, imagine she's the only woman in this council, you know, 20, 30, 40 people. I don't think they all turned up on every single time day. You know, you're dealing with a lot of men. Half you, half them, you know, are your supporters. But obviously, she kept Edward's counsel as well, or at least some of them, because you needed that, those experienced statesmen. And she can't trust them. I mean, she can't trust anyone. You know, she's been betrayed so many times by certain different people. You know, she's the only woman. She has to scream just to try to get attention. And I think she she wonder, um She says at one point that you know. You would never have treated my father like this. So why, how dare you treat me like this? You know, and she goes on and, you know, she always tries to bring herself back to her father because that's the only way they listen, which is a shame, you know. she. So it is sort of her inner Isabella coming out saying, you know, if you do not do what I say, I can be like my father. You know, I don't want to be, but I will. You know, and unfortunately, she does have to act like her dad every so often. Yes. It, it's unfair. It's clearly it was it really sexist is. at the time, but it was a different time, obviously. Um, yeah. I would like to transition a little bit to your specialty and okay. talk about <laughs> talk about how she presented herself to the public. Yeah. What was the very first thing that she commissioned? Was it a coin? Was it a portrait? Ooh. Oh, you love the difficult question, don't you? Sorry. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, those. No, 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 it, no, because it, it's a very valid question. And it's actually a question I was asked in Nevada, you know, what did come first? And unfortunately, I can't tell you because it's because a lot of these records, they've either been lost or they were, you know, just discussed. Well, they, they've, they've been lost. We don't know exactly when portraits, I mean, we sort of we can guess when portraits were made due to tests, and, you know, other accounts. And we know when it was definitely present. So, I mean, I think your viewers are familiar with the Han Jewett portrait, the big one with her in the gold gown, the one that very much looks like Holbein's Whitehall mural with Henry. You know, they're complete mirror images. So she, she's standing in the middle, her hips, her hands are by her womb. She's very like a triangular notion, very centre. We think it's 1554, early 1554. Before Antonius Moore's one said, so, you know, it could be the first six months of 1554. In terms of coinage, I would assume the coinage was the first because that's easy to do. Um, you do have the um, the legal roles, so the Michaelmas role, which I, I think, well, Emma's definitely spoken about it, and I, I'm sure your viewers have seen it before, um, where she's in that on that golden that throne with the angels with her either side. We know when that was made because it has to be done before the 29th of September, 1553, because that's when the legal term finished. So I would hedge my bets and I'll say that was the first image that we definitely know. There were a few other images that I think the, the French ambassador says, oh, you know, she's had a painting made. We don't know if that's, maybe that is the UF one or maybe it's the lost one, which we don't know yet. Yeah, we don't know. But I would say the Mikomas roll and the coins are definitely the first one. So like this beautiful, I mean, you can't see it probably, but this beautiful coin here where she's, she looks like a Roman empress. She really does. She has a, a closed crown. She's wearing a, you know, a loose part that she's got a nice necklace and a cross, very imperial looking. And obviously that's the image a lot of people would see. You know, we always talk about these beautiful paintings in stately homes, but no one's going to see them. I mean, you'd have the, the court will see them and the nobility, yeah. But the normal people won't. The only image they'll, the only time they'll probably ever see their monarch is on the coins. So that is actually the most important image that she has to make. So I would assume that was one of her first um, commissions because we do know one of her first parliamentary acts is to reform the coinage because obviously Edward and Henry had debased the currency so much that half the coins were worthless. Yeah, it's it's why a lot of anyone who finds Henry Henry coins now, they always say, Oh, you know, it's they're really damaged or they're green, you know, it's well, it's because they're made of really cheap metal. They they're not worth any you know, they're well, they're worth worth a lot now, but obviously back then they're they're not worth a lot. They're worth half of what they, they're meant to worth. So obviously one of her first acts is to reform it, bring all the old the dodgy coinage back. It's remint it to the correct standard of silver or gold or whatever it is. So, you know, and showing good coinage with a good figure of your monarch, that's a good sign. It means a healthy economy. It means, you know, stability. Yeah. And like you said, most people um, would only know her from the coins. I think it's easy mm. for us to forget in modern time that they didn't have the Internet. They couldn't yeah. look at all of these portraits. All they had were these coins. And they probably didn't even know what she looked like unless she came to their village and there was big pomp and circumstance. Well, exactly. exactly. And actually, it's I'm going to talk to her about this event because it's I find it fascinating. And a lot of people still don't know about it. So I think it's about 1556. We're not actually sure of the date of it, but we know it's sort of around this time because Mary goes and visits her cousin, Cardinal Pole, you know, the um, papal legate, and he has a place in Croydon, um, which is in, it's in London, for your international views. It's, it's around there. It's, it's in central, well, near London-ish. Um, well, modern-day London, anyway. Um, and we know that she went to visit him, visit him on the 18th of August, 1556. And years later, um, her lady-in-waiting, Jane Dormer, recounts a really interesting conversation, actually. Um, so Mary... She did the first royal walkabout and she didn't make a big fuss about it. She went in disguise. She disguised herself as a lady in waiting and she went around with all of her other ladies and she 
she visited, you know, she visited poor, not ordinary people. She went and shared their meals with them. You know, it's fascinating. You know, so you can imagine what they were eating or what they were sitting on. You know, very basic things. Anyway, this one time, <laughs> she visits a um, a collier. So he's a coal miner or a merchant or something that deals with coal. Anyway, he visits him and his wife, and she shares his meal, and you know, they get talking, and it comes on to pay. You know. Um, what he does and you know whether he's, he's been paid or not turns out he hadn't been paid and he hadn't been paid for quite a while so she then says friend is this true that you tell me and he obviously says yes you know madam you know the queen's men haven't paid me and you know, that, that's probably why they're so poor <laughs> anyway she tells him right if what you tell me is true i promise you i will go and talk to the queen on your behalf and we will sort this out. So anyway, you know, she, she then leaves the house. She goes to um, Rochester, who's her controller. And, she, and this is about the next morning. And she's because she promises the guy beforehand, come the next morning to the palace and we, you know, payment will be waiting for you. And so, oh, thank you, Madam. And she also goes back to court, goes, finds Rochester basically gives him a dressing down and says how dare you not pay this man and how dare you not pay his you know his colleagues and what's this going on it's an absolute disgrace and obviously you know what's like oh i'm so sorry i'm so sorry you know it was, it was a mistake and you know i didn't know about it you know blame someone some whoever <laughs> anyway she basically hits him around the face and says you know i want this sorted if you don't get it sorted i would think very hard about where your position is <laughs> It's like, oh no, I'm sorry, Major. I'm sorry, Major. Well, you know, I'll sort it. I'll sort it. Anyway, obviously, Mary then walks off, and Rochester tells D- Dormer, "How did she know we hadn't paid them?" And she says, "Well, she asked them." <laughs> what do you mean she asked them? Where'd she go? Well, she went and spoke to them. <laughs> what? She can't do that. <laughs> well, she's the queen. She can do what she likes. <laughs> but what I like, and I, you know, we don't know what happened. I hope the guy got paid. You know, and. You can then just imagine his face. You know, he goes and gets paid. You know, and then he look, maybe might, might look at the coinage, and I'm hoping the coinage is a good likeness. Thinks, oh my gosh, actually, I just, do you know who I just spoke to? <laughs> you know, and it's it's those stories. A lot of people don't seem to remember that. You know, you don't have these grand displays like Elizabeth did on Henry. You know, you don't have the the big um the pageants and all, you know those sorts of things. It's very intimate. You know, it's all done in secret as well. You know. She doesn't tell people who she is. She wants to know the truth because she knows if she goes in person, they won't tell her the truth. And, you know, there's loads of accounts. You know, she funds schools. She finds apprenticeships for pe- for boys and girls. You know, she did it at least twice. She helped a carpenter and his widow. You know, she always goes in private. She never does it publicly, which I find quite moving, actually. You know, because no one knew who she really was. But that's the only way to get the truth out of what's actually going on. It sounds like something her mother would have done. Definitely. You know, I would. I don't know if there's any records of her doing it, but it's definitely something I think maybe, you know, I think lots of queens probably did it, but we just don't know about it. But luckily, thanks to thanks to Jane Dorman, we do know Mary did this. <laughs> you know, I, I, I can't think of the time Elizabeth did it. Not on the top of my head. You know, maybe you know or someone else knows one. But all the only Elizabeth ones I can think of, obviously, grand displays. You know, you know it's the Queen, so you spend all this money trying to prepare for her. Whereas this is just Mary just going down in, down the streets. You know, completely, you know, she obviously had protection of people obviously around her. Yeah. But no one knew it was her, which I find really, really, really moving. Mary almost seems a lot more humble than you would expect. Definitely. she's. I think she's... She's one of those um, dual personalities. You know, she's very, she can definitely tell you when she's the queen and you feel that presence. You know, you do feel her family's anger. Um, but she's also a very humble woman, you know, a very private woman as well, I think. You know, she didn't like big displays. You know, it's why she didn't have, um, you know, massive, I mean, she she loved, you know, she did like pageants and all that sort of thing, but she didn't have progresses. You know, and lots of people say, oh, it's because they had no money and she didn't prioritise. But she probably just didn't like, you know, she didn't like them. And she knew if she'd actually gone to these things, 
and did these things, she'd just meet the same old people time and time again. Whereas if she did all these little private things, she'd actually get to the heart of what's actually going on, what are people's priorities, and how can she best sort those out? Yeah. And I think she was probably suffering with some health issues too that would have limited her from doing that. Definitely. You know, she did suffer from a lot of health issues. From well, of that we know, you know. Yeah. And, I'm, and I know we'll probably go and talk about that later. But yeah, she, um, you know, and just you can think, you know, without anesthetic and all modern medicine, think how much pain she would have been suffering those illnesses constantly. You know, it's not, you know, mm -hmm. I'm surprised she managed to do anything because she was in a lot, you know, she was in pain quite a bit of her life, you know, right. whether that mental or physical, you know, it's, and she still achieved what she achieved. It's remarkable. I mean, look at her father dealing with all the pain that he was in near the end of his life and how mm. he lashed out at people. And I feel like we don't see that from her. And I wonder if that's just the pressure of being a woman, too. Yeah, no, exactly. You know, you just have to carry on with it, don't you? It's, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, because I don't, I mean, she probably did get, you know, she did lash out. We know she lashed out. She did have a Tudor temper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, to your labor, you know, she doesn't want to be dealing with some idiot man <laughs> she's trying to deal with her own personal problems <laughs> and you know it's it's crazy i mean there's a i'm gonna yeah there's a um there's another account um it's just before the marriage where well, it's the um, during marriage negotiations and um who was it some um i think it was the leader of the house of commons or the house of well i assume house well anyway house of lords house of commons it was one of them <laughs> He went over, he went to the Queen and said, you know, we can't support this marriage to the to, to the Prince of Spain. It's absolutely ridiculous. And she obviously she I mean at this time, normally it would be the Lord Chancellor to respond to that sort of request. You know, Mary shouldn't have to do it. And Stephen Gard is about to say something. And Mary then stands up and belittles this poor man and says, How dare you talk to me like this? You would never spoke to me, to your my father like this. Does a a monarch not have a right to choose choose who they marry. If you force me to marry someone else, I will die in three months. You know, she threatens him, and the poor guy's like, "Oh my god!" And anyway, he then gets escorted off. She then turns to Garth and says, "How dare you make me put, put myself in this position?" He says, "Oh, I'm so sorry, you mentioned him. So sorry, I'm so sorry." And then someone, I can't remember who it is, but someone next to Garth then says, "Well, I think the Queen's just taking your job, sir." <laughs> Because obviously it was his job to, to reply to the statement, but she already she took advantage of it, and it's, you know it's like she's just surrounded by idiots, right? You know, right. I mean, well, I say idiots, you know, they're not, they're probably very clever people, but they they don't think, <laughs> they right. don't think. Oh, you know, she does. She is an experienced diplomat. You know, she's. I mean, she's been looking after diplomats since she was about five years, five six years old. She knows how to deal with these things. You know, she know. I mean, she knows her cousin very well. You know, she knows how Charles works. She probably didn't know Philip that well, but she knew how Charles, you know, how his mind worked. And it's, it's all mind games, you know. It's when she, you know, when she sends letters to him, it's not her in desperation. It's, she knows what will get his attention, how he will respond to get what she wants. It's all about, you know, whose trap is whose. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, yeah. And we're just realizing how complex that sort of diplomacy really is. So when she wanted to marry Philip, the biggest concern was that we'd have a Spanish <laughs> king. And so yeah. she made it her mission, in my opinion, to show everybody that, no, she was the queen. He was yeah. second to her. And she did this through portraits and through coin. Can you maybe explain a little bit without even like having to show the portraits of the <laughs> coin? Maybe you can describe it yeah, a little bit. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, you know, that is a massive thing, you know. How do you present a woman who is, a, you know, she is a queen, she's queen in her own right. How do you present her husband, who is also king? Because he is, he is king of, you know, he, well, king of the, um, you know, he's prince of Spain and he is king of England. That's his title. But he's, you know, he's, and you know, there's a lot of work, especially around with Spanish scholars at the minute. And, you know, Emma's done some work on this as well. You know, there is this big thing was Philip, can, do we, should we call Philip King of England, Philip the First? You know, and there's a big debate over whether or not he should or not, you know, is it a dual monarchy like um, William the Third and Mary the Second? Sort of, but not, it's not like that at all. It's, 
they're both monarchs and i you know i do talk about it in the thesis they are like like it's like isabella and ferdinand they're both joint monarchs they're both independent of their own territories but they also have they do have influence in their spouses territories but mary made it quite clear in the treaty you know you will be called king but you are not king or at least you're not king in the traditional sense you know, yes, you can deal with your military stuff, but that's your right because you're a man. We, you know, that's your job. You're meant to go and fight. I'm. Um, I'll look after the domestic policies, and I, you know, he can sign anything without her signature first. Whereas she, you know, she can sign whatever she likes, and it's very interesting to see in the imagery. She's always the dominant figure, and um, there's lots of you know she's always on the well our left, but it's their right, so. I'll say our left because it's easier to visualise it. So she's she's on the left until they marry in most of the documents. And then even then, they don't always, doesn't always work. So she stays on the left until 1556. There's a few um, attempts of trying to work out, oh, how do we present him? Sometimes they're presented on their own, which doesn't work. It, it was only in two documents I found that. Um it's only when he becomes king of Spain they swap the positions. He's then on the left, she's on the right. But he doesn't he really he only holds the scepter two, three times, top of my head. She's always holding the scepter. And in my eyes, the scepter is more powerful than the sword. Because the scepter is a sign of kingly or queenly you know, kingly authority. The sword is just military might, you know. And like I said, that's Philip's job. He's a man. He's meant to go and fight these wars. She's the ruler. And it's you know, it's in terms of the Great Seal, you know, there's a lot. I've, I've done a lot of work on seals in general with how the process was made. But Philip's not on it again until fifty six. So it's not until he becomes king of Spain, and even then, it's, he doesn't last that long on it. Maybe, and he's. I'm trying to prove that in a minute. But yeah, you know, there is. There's a lot of concern about how do we present Philip in all these things, and then on the coins. You know, we spoke. You know. A lo- mo- most people will just see Philip on the coins. He's only present- presented on two de- denominations, the shillings and the sixpence. He's not on the groats, he's not on the pennies, he's not on the gold coinage. So it's, it's clearly just for those who know. So like shillings and sixpence are probably trade, you know, their merchants are going to be using them to, you know, and they're going to obviously travel into his kingdoms. So it's probably they want to see him on there. But the groats, the pennies, you know, the lower denominations, which most poor people will be using, well, they're never going to see him on it. I mean, they've got his name on the groats, but you know, people are more focused on the image, aren't they? They're not going to look at the writing. Um, and obviously the gold coins for the nobility, well, they don't want to see him on it, and they don't see him on it. So it's that very like middling class, middling sort sort of people who actually have Philip on their coinage. So it's really, yeah, it's really interesting, you know, and it is a battle. There is a big battle of a dominance in imagery, um, but you'll have to wait for the thesis for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to talk about one portrait in particular because I saw it again online yesterday and maybe it was Emma that posted it. It's the one is of them as a couple where they're like yeah. body proportions are weird and she's yeah. sitting, she's and sitting standing. and he's kind of like sitting on the arm yeah. of the chair. Yep, I have a I have a really good fear on that actually. I don't. I mean, it might be gobbledygook. I don't know, but yeah, because I've seen it. I've seen the picture in real life. So actually, I'll ask you, what kind of dress do you think she's wearing? Oh gosh, now I got to picture it. Um, <laughs> I want to say gold. Yeah, it's gold. And what's the other color? Oh, um, <laughs> let's. I'm just going to take an educated guess here and say black. That's interesting. So. A lot of people say it's black. So obviously I had to go over to the painting and get as close as you could get without them taking me off, taking me away. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually it's actually dark blue. Oh. So she's wearing blue and gold. And her personal colours were blue. So it's nothing to do with like because a lot of people say, Oh, the gold, the black and gold are to do housebergs. Well, no, it's actually blue. So her dress is blue and gold. So that's really interesting. But what I find interesting about that portrait is that I don't think Philip was meant to be standing originally. I think they've changed it because they've realised they can't have him sitting. Because if he sits, it means that he's 
got the same authority as her. But if she sits and he stands, it means she's still got the authority because the monarch can sit first. And only the monarch can, you know, you have to stand in front of your monarch unless you're invited to sit down. So I think there's obviously a power move going on there. Obviously, you have the joint titles, and you know, it's, it's a wonder. It's, it's a beautiful painting, it really is. But we don't know who painted it. We know it's painted in 1558, and we don't know who it was, was originally for. Was it for Mary, or was it for a member of court? You know, who actually commissioned it? We we just don't know. And I'd love to find some. You know, if I was a millionaire, I'd go and get it tested, and we would find out all these answers. You know, was Philip changed? during the process i think it was because the chair doesn't make sense where it is and the way he's standing looks like he's meant to be sitting but they've moved the chair or moved him or they've done something yeah that's why you've got those weird body proportions yeah it is very okay so what is your theory then on the two dogs down by her feet yeah i mean that's just to show it's an alliance it's a marriage alliance you know they're just to present fidelity you know she's not going to choose from you for it don't worry Philip's not meant to cheat on her, but we know he did. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's all about strength. It's about this union, union of two powerful countries. Yeah, and because you know they are king and queen of Spain at this point. Yeah. So was it for, was it for a Spanish audience, or you know a, a European audience, or was it for an English audience? It's very you know because that would then determine whether or not there was a mistake in Philip or an alteration, or if it wasn't. It's really interesting. I'd love to do more work on it if I could. Mm. You know what I was just thinking? Um, Mary never had a coronation in Spain, did she? No. No, she didn't, which is really unfortunate. I know, could you imagine? If she if she'd lived longer, do you, I wonder if she would have. If she'd able if she'd been able to go to Spain and make sure she actually still had a, a throne when she got back. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, well that's that was the trouble, wasn't that? That is the trouble. <laughs> you know, it's it's stupid. Like she should have been married long before she was. Mm-hmm. She may have been able to then visit Spain or wherever she'd gone. Then understood, you know, she may have had more respect then. Um, you know, but if she had been more stable, would she have gone over to Spain and would they, she have been crowned? I mean, there are images of her well, in the Netherlands. Obviously, that was owned by Spain at the time. So, it's yeah. No, she was never crowned. But she did have a, a funeral. They did, they did on her with a funeral, um, obviously with Ch- when because it was it was a joint funeral. Um, well, it was hers, Charles's, and Mary's, Mary of Hungary's, um, Philip and well, actually Philip and Ferdinand both gave her a few. Well, not well, it is a funeral really because that's what the documents say, but it's more of a memorial service, I guess, really for our context. Interesting. So she did, yeah. So she did have she did have a memorial. <laughs> So she she was important in Spain, more important than we probably give her credit for. Oh, definitely. You know, I mean, I don't think she interfered with the politics as much, but, you know, she wouldn't because that's that's Philip's job. That's why he's over there. That's why he's in the Netherlands. But, you know, they they I think I would like to think that they did think of her as their queen. Actually, they did because um, I can't remember who said it, but there was a um, I was reading it earlier, actually, and they were they were saying. It was some ambassador, and they said, "Why can't Mary just be our queen, like in total? Why do we need Philip? Because, <laughs> because she does a better job. She's a better example of king of kingship than both Charles and Philip. We don't like Charles and Philip, but we like Mary. So you know, so you do think, oh, you know, could she? You know, how widely was that belief? You know, did the population actually like her?" more than their own king mm-hmm. you know we don't know but she was their queen you know and i'd love to find some evidence of visual culture in spain of her you know it's, i've not found any yet um there's n- none on the coinage but they don't really put their bonnets on their coins so you can't really talk, look too deeply into that mm-hmm. but you know if emma emma, emma, if emma knows any <laughs> please let me know I was or just going to say, if anyone knows, you know, also you have the paintings, but I'd love to know if there's any local, you know, local gentry have paintings or something, you know, what sort of images do they have? It'd be really interesting to know yeah. how widespread it was. Because we know her, you know, we know her portrait was sent across to Spain 
and it was sent to members of the Golden Fleece. So lots of Habsburgs and um, you know courtiers in the Europe did have an image of her, because that's why there's so many of her in Europe. You know, so why there's loads in Austria and I mean, there's one in France and there's obviously some in Spain. So that they, you know, she did get around with her portrait, and actually that's quite important because in terms of portraiture, a lot of people saw the portrait as the physical embodiment of the person. It's like their proxy. Mm. So as long as the portrait's there, it means they're present, which actually gets into a funny story with Philip, but we can talk about that in a minute. <laughs> I want you to talk about it right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I need to, I, can't, I think it's 1557. I may be 1556. I think it's 57. So anyway, uh, yes, it's 1557. So um, there are not well. I guess well, they're rumors, but they're not really rumors. They're all based on fact. You know, a lot of people said this happened. Um, Mary was told Philip wasn't coming back anytime soon, and as a typical Tudor, she got very angry, <laughs> and she was in the um, privy chamber, and there was a portrait of him handing it out. So I sh- like I said, you know, it's the proxy. So. When they're not there physically, you've got a painting of them to show that they're, they're present. Anyway, depending on who you believe, she either ordered it to be taken down and carried off, because if he can't be bothered to come back to his wife, then what's the point of having a picture of, of him, which obviously removes his authority? Or she kicked it out. I like the kicking version, because I could just imagine that in some film or drama. You know, she tears the portrait down, she throws it out, and she Screams saying, "Why is my? Where is my husband? How can I have a child without my husband?" You know, <laughs> so you know, portrait was very important. And obviously, people then found out about this, and they said, "Oh, you know, she's hysterical, but she, she's doing this." But no, what she's actually doing is removing Philip's authority completely. Good for her. I probably would have done the same thing. <laughs> Mm, I can imagine. I think we all have done in that case. <laughs> I think nowadays we do things like throw darts at pictures, burn them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's exactly that. It's the early modern equivalent. Right. <laughs> oh, Peter, I've been having so much fun chatting with you about this, but we've been at it for a while and we're oh, going to join up Time again. <laughs> it does. But we're going to have a future episode with you and Emma and I think Melanie as well. That's going to be just as interesting. And oh, um, fantastic. we'll talk more, Mary, um, in that yes. episode. But until then, Peter, thank you so much for coming on today and talking about this amazing Queen Regnant that doesn't get the spotlight that she deserves. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs>